but it's important to me that people understand what's happening over there, to understand, because we as a country have not sacrificed. We just have not sacrificed in this war. Soldiers and Marines and others fighting over there and the civilians have sacrificed and their families have sacrificed. We as a country were never asked to do anything. So if I can tell these stories about them and cover this war, I think I'm doing something worthwhile. I mean, my kids understand that. My kids understand the sacrifice that others have made. I take them Christmas Eve to Bethesda Naval Hospital to visit Marines. I think that has had a real effect on who they are and, and hopefully the Marines that we visited, it meant something to them as well to see us there and caring. So because there isn't a draft um, and it's a volunteer army and, and so many people are disassociated from the war, y your suggestions about getting more involved or feeling more connected, what, visit somebody in a hospital perhaps? It, it's, I, I think that's actually quite difficult to visit people in a hospital, believe it or not, it, if it's a military hospital. If you know any family who has someone who is wounded, if you, ha if you know any family who has someone who is deployed, I think as a community, as a neighbor, you do what you can. It's not that yellow ribbon on the back of the car, all right? It, it, it is talking to them, it is figuring out what they need. One of, the, one of the soldiers who is now a colonel who I wrote about is now headed to Iraq for the fourth time. It's the fourth Christmas he will miss in a row. Is it because of stop loss or he chose? Oh, he chose. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean he's, he's a, colonel, he's a so volunteer. Yeah. He's a colonel. He's going right. back to, to, to take on a brigade. But his family, who are so supportive and live in a military community, they get all the support from the other military. Yeah. But the outside community, it, it's just completely separate. Right. And I think they feel it. Well, let's talk about one of the stories you've covered. We have a photo of you with uh, General Petraeus. And, um, Back when he had three stars, so he now has yes. four. And you were telling me, unfortunately, bef before the show, you were saying the man on the far right of this photo is no longer with, with us. With the red tie. He was one of those terrific Iraqis who sided with the Americans very early on and uh, was helping set up the police. So General Petraeus actually here was in charge of training Iraqi forces and police, and we were up in Mosul at the time. And we had lunch with that man, General Walid. And the next time I came into Mosul and I flew in in a Black Hawk helicopter and got out, and the military came up to me and said, we have very bad news. Um, I know you know General Walid. Someone just drove a, a suicide bomb into his office, and he was killed. So General Petraeus, I mean, for one thing, talk about a great name to be a general. Petraeus, <laughs> <laughs> Greek. Um, has the surge, is the surge working in your estimation? Is all of his philosophy I, bearing I think, fruit? I think unquestionably the surge has, had an, has made the security situation there so much better. Um, the political situation, they still have a long way to go over there, and that's always the question. Wasn't the surge supposed to bring about this political reconciliation? Um, I think one thing that people have to remember is the surge is actually not over. We think it is, but it's not quite over. There are 155,000 troops. Uh, there were 130 before the surge. I think one of the things you see about, uh, you know, will, will we draw down immediately after the election, depending on who gets elected, um, General Petraeus clearly is not drawing down in great numbers. We're seeing some photos of you with, with the military as, as we talk here, and that is certainly one way, probably the main way that you can get around a country this Black dangerous helicopter. Is, to, is to be with the military or as Marines you, there in as, uh, as, as you've written um, to go out with a general who is leaving and go to all the forward operating bases with that general is also another way to get some good information. This one by this um, tank was in the middle of Al Anbar and I was with at the time Doug Vogt who's the cameraman who was later injured with Bob Woodruff and Doug and I were in fact I just saw Doug yesterday who is in perfect shape now it's Wonderful. just amazing um, we were talking about this trip because it was 130 degrees out uh, I said, Doug, basically it's the first time I ever lost the hair battle. <laughs> it was so bad <laughs> and so hot um, that we were sleeping in the desert. We had nothing with us. They hadn't prepared us at all for this sleeping in the desert that night. This is, this is what I call the prematurely named Camp Victory. That is in Baghdad. That's my cameraman, Bartley Price. That's not Doug. Um, and Bartley and Doug um, are my principal cameramen over there when I travel. Although Doug is not going back in a war zone, so it's just Bartley. I've talked to other people who've flown in to 
Iraq, and I've heard you talk about it. Um, I talked to one reporter who said a man cracked his tooth behind her because he was so scared. So scared. It's um, between the, the heat, you know, it, it, how frightening is it? I mean, how scared do you get? On, on the flights, um, I, I think back on those flights now, and they are, I mean, at times they, they were terrifying. They, they, that's exactly what they do. They, they corkscrew right. or they do a, a tactical takeoff. Where, and essentially, if you think about it, and if I can show this, if, you're, if the airport's right here and the missiles are around it, you're safer at elevation. Mm -hmm. The higher you get, the better, the, the better off you are. So what they do is they corkscrew up as fast as possible, hopefully out of the range of the missiles, because if you went this way right. and you were low down and they could hit you. So that's what you do. I mean, you, I, I, I'm very good at talking my way into the flight deck, so at least you have a window, oh. because if you're in the back, you know, you're crowded up against the soldiers and you're basically, the little windows on the side of the cargo plane, you're looking at yeah, and be, basically I'd, you see the ground I'd the whole sick. time. Yeah, I'd be sick. <laughs> <laughs> you see the ground the whole time. iPods help in there, Yeah. <laughs> play a little music, try to think of something else, but when you're when you're in the flight deck and you're with the crew up there and you're sitting there, it's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. There there is one, uh, uh, there's something they do as night vision. I mean, when it was very very bad, I remember flying from Mosul to Baghdad, and they did map of the earth flying, which means you literally just stay mm -hmm. very low and and follow the ground, um, and and in helicopters especially, it is. Uh, I mean. Most of the flights, there was a time there when they were shooting down a lot of helicopters, and it was it was a it was actually a terrifying time. And we would go close to the ground because again the missiles, and if you stay if you stay low, you have less of a chance of getting hit by a missile, but more of a chance of getting hit by small arms fire. But they would go up and down over telephone poles, and that is, depending on how you look at it, really quite when, terrifying. When you uh spend that much time with the military, can, and we're going to talk about your book next, can you, can you be removed or distant or unbiased or can you keep that relativity and not find yourself I, siding I, I with know, the military? I know, that's a, I, I, I think it's a really interesting issue that we'll look at for a long time. This is my feeling that, look at my work, and when there were issues with the military or when they were perceived to have been Abu Ghraib, whatever, you can be as objective as possible tell you what I'm not objective about. Those who've been killed and those who are wounded. I think as Americans, you, and as a journalist, I, I don't have to be objective that that is a, a sad thing, I, a, an incredible sacrifice. But you feel um, you can still uh, be critical? Yes, aspects. absolutely, yes. and I have been. And, and frankly, the people I respect in the military are those who would come to me and say, you know what, this, this thing in Haditha was working. terrible. It shouldn't have happened. We need to look at this, and we need to take a hard look at this. And, and I, I think in that way you are objective. Are, am I with them all the time? Yes. Do I feel their pain in what they have to do? Yes. But can I be an objective journalist? I think they know that as well. I mean, they, it, 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 it's so interesting to travel out there. I remember running into a Marine, and I think we were in Ramadi, and he came up to me and he said, so are you one of the good ones or the bad ones? And I said, let me ask you the same question. Are you one of the good ones or the bad ones? And I just stared him down, and he said, good point. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah, said, so, we'll don't, so don't be coming to me and saying that, because I try not to do that. Well, let's talk about one of the battles that you became uh, aware of and, and felt was important to write about in, in The Long Road Home. Um, and that's the battle in April of 2004 uh -huh. in Sadr City. And uh, this is a group a, a military group who really thought that they were going to be welcomed as as liberators and were kind of doing more of a peacekeeping mission. I think we've got a photograph of the kind of vehicles that they were driving in, very open vehicles. Yeah, it which, was uh, it was made a them real change. Quite a target. Quite the target. And this was, you know, think of the timing. It was it was shortly after a year. It was a Shiite area, and that's especially why the U.S. thought it'll be fine in that area. Um, and the 1st Cavalry Division had just taken over, really literally when this battle broke out, at precisely the time they came under fire. There had only been one soldier killed the year before, and I always hate to say only because one soldier is one soldier. But they thought they'd be handing out candy. They told their families that. And within minutes they had eight dead and 60 wounded, the largest loss of life for the 1st Cavalry Division in a single day since Vietnam. 